Okay. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for, for uh, coming to this event. Um, uh, this is an event of the London Philosophy Club uh, and I'm very pleased uh, to have uh, John Higgs uh, with us today to talk about his new book, uh, William Blake versus the World. Uh, John uh, has, is just telling me he's been um, a professional writer for, for 10 years and in that time he's published 10 books, uh, including a biography of Timothy Leary, um, his first book was um, about the KLF and their relationship to, to kind of a cult and, and thinking and magic. Um, he's written fantastic cultural histories of Britain, of the monarchy, um, and he's a really unique uh, writer, really, uh, partly in this kind of history of ideas, but in an incredibly fresh way. Uh, and this is his um, second book on Blake. So obviously William Blake uh, means a lot to him and I'm looking forward to it just in terms of Blake's always been somehow I find it I know he's a very important figure but he can be a bit intimidating because he's such a kind of his fantasy realm is so vast and you're not quite sure where to start so I'm really glad to have a, a guide to, 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 to kind of navigate us through this uh, this terrain um, so John is going to speak for um, about 45 minutes and then we'll do uh, we'll take people's uh, questions and have a kind of discussion um, at the end of that. Um, so, John, over to you. Lovely. Thanks, Jules. Um, I hope everyone can hear me OK. Uh, oh, yeah. Am I OK? I'm just seeing you. Thumbs up. OK. Uh, well, thanks all for coming. It's, um, it's quite a treat to talk about Blake to a audience more interested in the mind than um, an, in, an audience more interested in, you know, the art or the philosophy or the poetry of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of the usual sort of Blakeian uh, interest. Um, I'll just start by giving a bit of background information about him for anyone who's kind of new to him. Uh, William Blake was an, an artist, uh, a painter, uh, an engraver, a poet, uh, and a visionary. Uh, he was a man who saw visions. And this was a thing that went throughout his entire life from when he was a, a small boy and he walked to Peckham Rye and he saw a, a tree and on every, every branch and every brow there was, there was angels looking down at him. Uh, this continued throughout his entire life until his old age. Uh, and this, his life was a, a really fascinating time in, in, in European history, really. Uh, it, he was born 1757 and died 1827. And so he got to see um, the American Revolution and particularly the French Revolution uh, very, very close. And also it was the age of enlightenment, this, 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 this uproar of um, rationality, which in many ways, as I'll, as I'll get to, he sort of um, fought against. Uh, he was... He was certainly a political radical. Um, there was one incident uh, in the, the three years he lived outside of London, he lived in Feltham on the Sussex coast, and he found this soldier in his garden. Um, and he got angry with him for being there. And he sort of, uh, even though he's a much more smaller man, he sort of got him by the arm and sort of marched him down the road to the to the Fox Inn where he was billeted. And uh, the soldier insisted that during this time, Blake had been saying things like, damn the king, which at the time was sedition. Uh, and this was a very paranoid time when people were expecting Napoleon to invade. And so he was on trial for sedition and, and you know, could have, could have uh, had the death penalty. But uh, fortunately, all the people of, of Felpham said, um, no, we, we, we didn't hear him say anything like that. Um, but it's very noticeable that it is exactly the sort of thing uh, he would have said. Um, so he spent his life making art essentially, um, but not successfully, not uh, as in terms of a, a, a successful rich career. Um, he worked so astonishingly uh, diligently and hard and the amount of work he created in his life is, is just astonishing. And if anyone was lucky enough to see, there was a, a, a huge retrospective exhibition at uh, Tate Britain in 2019 room after room after room it had about 300 works just the, the sort of overwhelming sense of a man just compelled to create um and that's just a fraction of, of, of what he did we know so much of his stuff was burned after his death because it was believed to be inspired by the devil um but as i say he was not successful in his own time 
Um, he had one exhibition in his entire life, and that was above his brother's shop. Uh, and it sold no works, and it had one review, uh, which referred to him as an unfortunate lunatic, um, which certainly, you know, hurt him very much. And he died penniless in a, and was given a pauper's burial in Bunhill, Bunhill Fields. And when you sort of tell his life story like that, it's easy for it to sound tragic, but it just wasn't. That's just not how he sort of, how, how he uh, perceived himself uh, or his work uh, or the world really. There's a, love, a lovely story um, when he was an old man, um, he, he was talking to, uh, I think she was about six, a girl of about six. Uh, and he was saying, oh, I hope that when you're old, you'll be as happy as I am. And she sort of looks up at this sort of uh, impoverished, you know, um, penniless sort of ancient figure. And it just, she just can't understand why he's saying that. It just makes no sense to her. And she lived her entire life. And when she, when she got to about age 80, then she understood. She understood what he meant. Uh, and she understood that essentially, as, as it appeared to him, he was living in paradise. Uh, and that's what matters in life. That's that's the that's the value of it. So it's um, it's it's a figure that um, I called the book that I wrote this, this book here, William Blake versus the World, because it's normally presented in the style of um, uh, oh this uh, you know rejected, mocked uh, uh, you know unsuccessful career artist uh, defeated by the world. But uh, he was he was. Um, that's 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 not the in, that's not the interesting perspective uh, on Blake. There's um, uh, behind me. Uh, there is probably freaking out a few people. Uh, puppet William Blake, which is made by uh, a local puppet ma uh, maker, a wonderful woman called Myra Stewart, and she makes things like puppet Alan Watts and you know uh, puppet Timothy Leary and all these interesting counterculture um, uh, characters, and she performs with them at festivals and things like that. Uh, and you just had to make puppet William Blake, even though it's on one level, it's just like so wrong. It's really wrong. It's like, you know, Blake was nobody's puppet. Um, but at the same time, you know, all the representations we have him is like a few paintings and, and, and still pictures. And to see him still is wrong. He was about energy, energy's eternal delight sort of thing. He should be a moving sort of thing. Uh, and we deliberately sort of went for old Blake, a real sort of Statler and Waldorf um, concoction, because old Blake would have been delighted to be a puppet. He would have been overjoyed. He would have just thought it was a lovely sort of thing. If there was a period in middle age, he wouldn't have been happy about it at all. You know, he, we went through a, a, a lot of difficulties in his life, but he, he sort of came through them um, in this joyous way. And it comes down to his, his, his uh, uh, how he saw the world, which is what I'll start talking to now. Jules, is it possible to share the screen, to do the hosty thing so I can get slides and things together? Sure thing. Um, Thank you. Okay, sorry, make host, there you go. Yeah, is that good? Yep, you should make be able to share now. Yeah, share screen, here we go. Now, hopefully that works for people. Not in, Jill's not in drink. Um, I think, I think the first thing we should really stress about Blake, even though it is, it is his mind and how he saw the world that uh, really I'm here to talk about, is that he was brilliant. He was amazing, you know, as, as an artist, um, he was a real talent. I've just put a couple of my favorite images to sort of hopefully demonstrate that. Um, uh, Christ in the Sepulchre. I mean, I just, I just love this partly for the atmosphere, um, the sort of the, the, the gothic gentleness of it. But uh, it's essentially something very ethereal, uh, very immaterial, and yet just by composition, he's given it, you know, the solidity of architecture. He's he's made the the immaterial um, eternal essentially, just, just through his, his design. And that's extremely Blakey. It's a very, very Blakey sort of thing to do. It's, you just don't see compositions, you know, like that by any, any contemporary artist around the same time. Um, and 
while he'll do something like that, which is just so so elegant, really, and so um, uh, graceful and, and beautiful, you also get real sort of like fierce, you know, heavy metal sort of images. Um, this is the the red dragon and the woman clothed in the sun. And if you to ask most um, artists to, to paint a picture of you know the uh, the red dragon, you would see the red dragon. You would you would see the face. Um, Blake knew that it's scary if you don't, you know, if, you, if, the, if this face is only in your imagination, then that's the purest and most scariest sort of thing. So instead, what he wanted to show was the strength, show the strength of the thing, you know, that, so that's, we see the back and all those muscles and those, those bat-like wings. And it's just, again, just an extraordinary piece of work, because you have to remember, to, just to put this in context, that, um, English art in the 18th century was that. That's basically what English art in the 18th century was. It really wasn't things like this. It really wasn't. Blake was you know, utterly unique. You know, there was no peers producing similar sort of sort of work in this, um, which is a, a, another a real favourite of mine. Uh, Daniel being rescued from the waters. It's the way that these these angel uh, characters are looking at you. You know, they're they're breaking the fourth wall. Uh, things like that to see at that sort of time are just astonishing. It's just a, you, you don't get people making art like Blake did, but at the same time, you get things like this. He was a poet, um, and, and uh, he's as well known as a poet as he is a painter. Now, that's also something that just doesn't happen. There's no other contemporary figure that's in the canon equally as a poet. Um, uh, and as, as a visual artist. And some of the words that um, uh, that he wrote, uh, obviously these will be very familiar, especially to people in England. Um, in fact, I would go as far as to say these are probably the most famous words uh, written by an English poet who didn't go to university or grammar school. He's a, a working class writer. who is probably the most famous English words uh, that they are. And they have, um, uh, extraordinary wide appeal, certainly this, the, the hymn Jerusalem. Um, it's, we probably think of it in terms like this. It's, um, it's the, this is the last night of the proms. This is um, patriotic, it's flag waving, it's the establishment. Uh, and Blake can fit in that very, very well. But at the same time, you're just as likely to hear this song be played by, say, a socialist folk singer like Billy Bragg, or um, you know, a band like The Fall, uh, or KLF, or you know, a, a brass band from a uh, colliery area. Um, everywhere, everywhere um, embraces Jerusalem. It's you know, it's played at the WI in front of most meetings. It's sung by the English cricket team. You know, you hear it sung by the Labour Party conference and the Tory Party conference. Um, it's got this utterly unique ability to appeal to the establishment and the counterculture and the left wing and the right wing and also and I think this is probably unique to Blake to appeal to atheists and agnostics as well as um, the religious or the spiritually inclined. Um, it's the thing that's special about Jerusalem, because it is the English, you know, national anthem. It's the unofficial English national anthem, because officially there isn't one. Uh, officially, we use um, the, the British national anthem. Right? Uh, so, yeah, officially there isn't one, but basically there is, and we all know it, and we all know it's Jerusalem, and it's Jerusalem because we've all agreed that it's Jerusalem, uh, and it hasn't been sort of imposed by the state, it hasn't been imposed on on high. It's just all the people have just decided that that's it, which makes it much more special, really, much more, you know, um, uh, precious and, and, and valuable sort of thing. Um, and when I talk to um, people about Blake, there's always this sense of a, a connection, a sort of a recognition um, uh, a friend said recently, um, I don't understand Blake, but I know he's my boy. You know, I know I'm on his team. That sort of feeling that he's, 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 uh, he's important and we're connected to him. 
But that other thing she said, I don't understand, Blake. That is also incredibly, uh, incredibly common. People are sort of drawn to him, but they don't kind of know what to do about it. They don't feel that they can just read him, really. Or, or they, uh, uh, the best analogy I, I have is that he's like this, like, like glorious Gothic castle. Uh, and inside there's just wonders and treasures. But we just don't know the way in. We just don't know how to get inside, you know, this, this, this castle of Blake. And some people feel that um, maybe they're not allowed, maybe they need permission, you know, maybe it's too hard. Uh, maybe there's gatekeepers, you know, who will judge you for not knowing the secrets. Um, lots and lots of, lots of reasons. A common one, a very common one, is, this, is the, that Blake wrote using his own personal mythology, while all his peers would, you know, take uh, Greek mythology uh, or biblical uh, mythology uh, and base their stories around that. Blake just scrapped all that and created his own. And people who haven't been raised on it, who haven't been taught about it, will just go, that's, you know, I, that's hard. I don't know. I don't know how to, how to go about uh, getting my head around that. And I don't think this is, this, is, this is the problem. I think we're good at mythology. I think that's one thing we're great at. If you look at something like um, the Weeping Angels from, from Doctor Who, right? These are the weeping angels. Uh, they uh, essentially they feed by sending people back in time, and they're a quantum event, so that they cannot move when they're observed. And the image of an angel is also an angel. Uh, and if you look one in the eye, then it will live within your eye and in your mind. And this is the mythology of the weeping angels. And it's, it's, it's mind bending stuff, but it's for eight year olds. You just give it to eight year olds, you know, and they get it. They just, they just totally understand it. You know, we can totally do mythology. Um, I think the problem is, is more to do with a fundamental difference in Blake's worldview compared to um, the entirety of Western thought for want of, want of a, a better thing. I'm going to take this angel away and, uh, and stop it scaring me um, for a while. Um, uh, and the issue is this, um, and it's an issue that's it's so deep in the foundations of Western philosophy um, that it's we can't see it. It's buried. And because we don't see it, we don't question it. Uh, and it's the idea that the immaterial is away or exterior or, or over there somewhere. It's like, um, you know, heaven. You can't get to heaven. Uh, it's, not, it's not nearby. Maybe after death you can go to heaven, but you can't go there now. But it's somewhere. It's a someplace, but it's, it's beyond. Um, and this is an idea that mainly comes to us uh, thanks to the Greeks. At least this is how I understand it. And in fact, I'm quite pleased to be talking to a philosophy club because if you can, you know, shed any more light on this, uh, on the history of this idea to me, that would be very helpful and I'd be very, very keen. But uh, so correct me if I get any of this wrong, but as I understand it, uh, you can find it with the Pythagoreans, um, but really it's Plato that sort of, uh, uh, popularized it the most for, 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 for our purposes uh, in his concept of forms, you know, the concept of uh, these idealized forms that are off somewhere uh, else. So, you know, for a chair to exist in the material world, there has to be the concept of a chair uh, in, an in an immaterial realm. Um, and that concept will be perfect, you know, not like our, our real chairs that down here. Um, so th these things, the platonic forms that are in this realm that's elsewhere. And I think, um, I think it's Aristotle then wasn't into this uh, and he argued about it and he, you know, for Plato, the world of forms and the world of matter were separate and Arist Aristotle, you know, argued against it, that, that they were um, connected or, or, or however, you, however you put it. 
but then the early Christian church came along and they just this idea was great for them they just picked up the idea that the immaterial was you know beyond and elsewhere um, because it helped make their religion universal and it freed you know the, the God of the Hebrews from the land of Israel it became it became a universal sort of thing so they ran with this this idea and so all through the you know the history of monasteries and the scribes and uh, there was that early early learning through the medieval period um, through to the you know the the uh, the opening of the great universities of Oxford and Cambridge and uh, where Greek thought was and rote learning was was there this idea that the immaterial was elsewhere was just utterly central and utterly integral and it sort of it sort of chimes with a lot of uh scandinavian mythology which had the you know the, the three realms um we were in the middle earth or midgard or, or middle earth as, as tolkien used to call it um but it's not it's not found in british mythology and irish mythology and things like that where you get the land of tin and uh, the land of the ever young and and um things that are accessible. It's like that we just pass through them very, very sort of gradually. Uh, and it's very different to say Vedic philosophy uh, and Indian thought. Um, it's just a quirk of the Mediterranean, really. It's a quirk of, of, of Greek philosophy that's come to this island and, and become embedded. Um, but Blake wasn't having it. Blake did not in any way uh, except that the uh, the immaterial, the spiritual, the imagined uh, was an exterior thing. As he said, um, and I got, a, got it on here. Yeah, he put it very, very clearly when he said, um, oof, men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Everything is internal um it's heaven hell god angels demons they're all things in sizes that we create in our imagination um and it's kind of a philosophy that i think is kind of useful to look at again in the sort of you know fairly secular 21st century because we're kind of you know most people for example don't believe that like hell exists that hell is a real physical place that is somewhere maybe somewhere far away but somewhere that you could in theory find on a map uh, that you could be sent to most people don't accept that but we've probably all known someone who at some point has been living in hell and we probably all know that to to deny that is wrong it just feels wrong in some way it, it's it's it, the reality of that experience um has to has to be respected and, and 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 valued and so once you start to accept that something like hell is a state or an internal state a state of mind um when you get back to blake talking about living in paradise then suddenly that starts to make sense as well uh the idea that um yeah, you know, if you if if people can have a hellish internal existence, they could also have a really sort of blissful one. It's not something you, you hear about much in, in today's media. But Blake was insistent that he had it, that he, he was. Um, well, there's this fantastic quote from his wife, Catherine, uh, where she said um, something like, I don't see much of, of Mr. Blake these days. He's always in paradise. We have that written down. We don't know what tone of voice she said it in. Uh, I'd love to know. I'd love to know what tone of voice she said that in. It, it could have gone any, any, any number of, of different ways. Um, yeah, so yes, uh, this, this, this sense of, of li living in paradise, this, this sense of um, seeing, seeing the world golden. In fact, there was a lovely, I got it here, I have got it here. It was, I, I was lucky enough to see his notebook recently uh, in, in the British Library. And um, there was this page in particular. Well, A, it's got that lovely um, self-portrait on. But this just this, this comment here, 23rd of May, 1810, 
found the world golden. Now, it doesn't mean that the world had been physically changed, that someone had come along and replaced the world with a golden version of it. It's a change was internal, like it was a change within him. It was how he then perceived the world. And if you read, you know, his epic, epic longest poem, Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, the emanations of the giant Albion, um, which is he considered his most important work. He's basically through an act of the imagination turning L London into this, this golden, you know, spiritual city. Um, and he obviously doesn't mean that people uh, go in there and building or carving golden pillars on St. Pancras and all these things he's talking about. It's, a, it's about a change within him that affects how he perceives uh, the world. Uh, and um, this does not mean that this is, this is very different from uh, sort of someone who was, say, very comfortable um, uh, having a nice life, just sort of pretending that everything's lovely uh, and sort of denying all the bad things in the world. Uh, you don't get that uh, with Blake, that sort of head in the sand, la la la, everything's fine. It's, it's the opposite of that. I mean, if you look at poems like London, and a lot of his work really, um, there's, 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 there's a real sort of anger uh, about uh, social issues and injustice and, um, uh, and cruelty uh, and suffering. You know, he really sees these things with, with respect to things like ch ch child chimney sweeps at the time or, or just inequality or just, just cruelty in, in, in general. He was very, very socially aware and, and very radical about these things. But at the same time, he could perceive the world uh, as, as this sort of this golden paradise um, because, the, because he was very clear that there was a distinction between what you observe and how you observe it. Those are two very, very different things. He would say things like, um, a fool sees not the same tree that the wise man sees. Um, how you perceive the world says as much about you as it does the world. Um, you probably all know this if you've, I'm not casting aspersions, but if you've been particularly say hungover or tired and uh, people are just really annoying. Uh, and if you think about it, maybe, maybe it's not the people, maybe that's not the reason, but at the time it's so convincing. You're so convinced that people have just been deliberately, you know, uh, uh, annoying to sort of, sort of wind you up. Um, we really fall for how we perceive things. Um, it's very, very tempting, really, in, in, in the sort of media environment we have. It's very, very easy to take the uh, view that people are terrible. Uh, and we're all fucked, right? That's a very simple worldview to adopt. And if you're in the media, as I say, you'll probably be taken quite ser seriously with that, that worldview. People sort of nod and, and stroke their chins. And you can use all your, you know, your wit and intelligence to come up with brand new perspectives on why everyone's terrible to give to people. And, and you can get a good sort of career out of that. But there's the extent to which that's, that's, not the world, that's how you're choosing to observe the world, uh, although it remains very hidden for a lot of us. Um, it's, it's, Blake was very, very clear about it. He was very, very clear there was a moral component to perception. Um, this is one of his letters. Um, I'll actually, I, yes, I'm just, his handwriting be what it is. I'll just read a little bit um, to you. He says, I see everything I paint in this world but uh, everyone does not see alike. To the eyes of a miser, uh, a guinea is more beautiful than the sun and a bag worn with the use of money has more, uh, more graceful proportions than a vine filled with grapes. The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. Uh, and then a few lines later, he just says it very clearly. As a man is, so he sees. And that's, um, that's so key. That's so key to sort of Blake's philosophy. Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting idea that appears in so many of my books before I got around to 
uh, writing about Blake, uh, when I wrote about people like Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson, uh, people connected to the counterculture in the 1960s, the psychedelic counterculture, they too saw the world in, in just this way. And so I've written about this idea quite a lot. And it's fascinating how people respond to it. Because for most people, it's a real insight. And they, they sort of get it and it's sort of, it's sort of a help really, because it jolts them out of, um, out of their, their, their rut of, of how they see the world. And they realize that um, it is something that they're responsible for, or at least no one else other than them. Is, is, is responsible for it. Um, that's the usual reaction. A lot of people find it liberating, but some people just hate it. They just, just hate it with fury. They see it as a real attack um, on their worldview, on how they see the world, which they insist is, is the right one, which is the one true way to see the world and everybody should see the world that way. And, uh, and often there's a great need not just to be not just to think of yourself as right, uh, but for other people to think of yourself as right. Uh, a need for other people to agree with you, uh, which is often the root cause of so much um, uh, well, noise uh, online and, and in social media. And there's a, there's a character in Blake's mythology um, who's behind this, this, um, this, this, this psychological need to be right. Uh, and it's this guy who's called Eurism. And as you see him here, you know, he's in this, this sort of great formless void and there's this, this, this strange light behind him and he's leaning out of this, this, this void being whipped by winds that we can't see and he's got his compass and he's building the rational world with his tools. And for most people, they would see an image like that and they'd say, oh, well, that's, that's there, that's, that's God, that's the God of the Old Testament, that's the, you know, the God who created the, the world in seven days. And um, because he looks so much like that, you've got things like this, which happened in 2019, which was St. Paul's allowed uh, him to be projected onto, uh, onto the dome of, you know, the, the great temple of British Christianity. Um, but as we, as we already know, for Blake, all these characters are internal they're sort of they're sort of part of us so you start to think about well what's the part of us that sort of builds the world uh, and sort of constructs um how we understand the world one one way of thinking about it is to think of a newborn baby who just doesn't have this mental model in their mind they, they're from the information from their senses it's just it's just chaos, essentially, noise and chaos, and they don't know what any, anything is. Uh, and um, very gradually, they start to recognize things and discern things. And it usually, well, yeah, the first thing is, is, is dark and light. That's, that's in, in child development, they sort of pick up on dark things and light things, which is why they're often fascinated by sort of black and white patterns at a very early age. They haven't got a sense of colors or anything at this point. They get dark and they get light. And then they might get like hot or then, you know, cold, um, hungry or not hungry. These sort of opposites appear and these opposites uh, sort of build up and build up and build up into sort of a way of categorizing the sort of world and basically labeling things. Uh, and their mind through this develops um, a model of the world, which they will then use to go on to sort of uh, you know, predict what's going to happen and, and uh, navigate uh, their life and, and things like that, and you know, a vitally important thing. When you, you think back to, you know, Genesis, the book of Genesis, uh, God creates the world in, in six days. Uh, he's very clear, it's, he creates it, he creates it. But when you look at what he's doing, you know, first he's, there's a terrible formless void with all this chaos, you know, and then he separates the light from the dark, and the, uh, the, the sea from the, the air and the, the land from the sea and you know, life from the land and things like that. He's just doing exactly what a newborn baby is. He's just, he isn't creating anything. He's just labeling things. He's just categorizing. He's just building his own worldview uh, and believing it and believing that that's the world, that the mental model in his mind is the real world because he created it. He thinks that he's the creator of the universe. And this is Blake's character, Eurism. He calls him the deluded uh, demon of heaven. He, um, 
he, he has created this finite, limited sort of rational world. And because there's no room for uh, anything truly divine in there, Blake often refers to him as Satan. He says, Eurism is Satan, which is why, you know, when St. Paul's projected him on their dome, um, for many Blakeians, that was, you know, very funny, really, because if you were to go and ask St. Paul, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, if you could project Satan on their dome, it's a fair bet that they're sort of going to say no. Um, this uh, painting is, is called Newton, and it's another uh, illustration of this character Eurism, this little rational part of our minds. And of course, Newton uh, is um, the great scientist Isaac Newton, and um, he was held up as one of the uh, you know, great architects of the Age of Enlightenment, which was the period that Blake was, was going through. And it was the period when people sort of went, uh, well, previously, you know, faith has been the sort of primary way of understanding the world. Maybe instead of faith, we should go for reason. We should definitely try and reason. Um, and Blake was certainly all for the sort of, you know, questioning of faith. Um, but he thought reason was just a small, limited finite part of what the mind was really capable of. And so in a painting like this, you get, um, well, where is he? Uh, he's often described as being underwater. He looks like he's in this sort of strange coral sort of sort of world. Uh, but, you know, he's quite dry. You know, his paper's quite dry. He's not in the water. It's that sort of, it's that, uh, it's a similar sort of formless, un unlabeled, unnameable void that we just saw you as in, in uh, a moment ago, but he can't see it. He's so focused on his rational circle and pyramid that he's he's building. That's all he can see. He can't see the wider world behind him. Uh, and that uh, rational thinking that he's so focused on is, is limited and finite and only a tiny part of everything, but it's all he sees. It's all that he sees, which is which is why it was um, you know so funny when they put this statue, which is a lovely statue based on Newton, but they put it outside the, the British Library, uh, which is basically a temple to that sort of rational sort of left brain way of viewing the world, way of thinking of the world. Um, again, uh, uh, something the Blakeians are sort of very sort of very uh, funny um, uh, misunderstanding of, of what Blake was trying to tell us. Um, it's that light, basically. It's that light behind Eurism that he's blind to, um, that, that Blake is wanting us to be uh, uh, aware of. He's wanting us to sort of be able to look outside of the world that our rational mind has constructed. And that includes essentially our sense of self. It's the story of ourself as of having a past and of, of having a future uh, and the sense of ourselves as like a, a narrative. Um, which is really what our sense of self is. It's a story, it's a narrative. There isn't a single part in our, in our, our mind that's our self, but we all think we have it. It's, it's the story that's sort of uh, constructed and it's so plausible and it's so, it's so convincing um, all the time that it's very easy to mistake it for reality rather than just, you know, uh, just to tell that a small part of our mind is, is, is taken. And he's desperate for us to sort of see outside of what Eurism can see. Uh, and he, he needs Eurism to recognize the sort of limited and, and small and finite sort of aspect of, um, uh, of, of, of this, this sense of the world. And because Eurism struggles with it, uh, he's sort of insecure. Uh, he, can, he can tip into this character that we saw earlier, which is the red dragon, Eurism uh, assumes a dragon form, uh, which is when he feels under threat, when his rational sort of sense of self uh, comes up to some cognitive dissonance and the suggestion that there's something outside it, that there's something larger that it can't see. It's not the whole story. Uh, and it fights against this, it really does. And it will usually do so angrily and furiously and hence you get like fundamentalism that sense that this is the one great truth and we have to protect it and everyone else has to agree to it because if they don't agree to it then maybe there are other truths and that's just not acceptable 
And you know, we all know that you know, there are about six billion people on this world and you know, no two people who see everything the same. You're never gonna find two people who um, have the same worldview and, uh, and agree on everything to the minute detail. And if you have any understanding of maths uh, in this scenario, you know, the chances that you are the one person who has it right, you know, that everyone else are, you know, just idiots who don't get it. Mathematically, you've got to see, see the problem with that. But this, this is Eurozone fighting against that. He's, he's just uh, uh, going on, on the attack. And he's, um, he's in many ways the opposite of this character, uh, which, which is Albion. This, this is a painting called Albion Rose. It's sometimes called, called Glad Day. And um, there's some argument it may be a self-portrait of Blake in his younger days. Apparently his, his blonde hair was, was sort of like that. But just as, um, just as Eurozone has this great light behind him, she cannot see, and Newton cannot see the, the world behind him, the, 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 essentially the divine light of the imagination, as Blake saw it. Albion is just basking in it. He's aware in it. He's just, he's just feeling it sort of flow through him. Uh, and for Blake, this, this light, which he associated with Christianity, for all he would mock um, religion and church, uh, and you know, he referred to the God of the Old Testament as um, Nobo Daddy, which is a very modern sounding sort of uh, uh, term. For all he would mock those, he, he just believed utterly in, in what you call the light of Jesus, right, inside you. But for him, it was the imagination. And the imagination was the divine spark. It was through the imagination that uh, new things could happen. That's where creation occurred. Uh, and, to, and our problem was that we'd fallen so far for years in story that it was blocking us and a lot of his work and especially uh, longer work like the four valors it's about the mind struggling to sort of regain its balance and for years and to realize how limited he is in which case he just he becomes useful again when he accepts that he's just a small part of things uh, then the mind can fall to balance and then the the, the visionary state that 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 uh, um, Blake experienced so often throughout his life, then that's when that comes forward. Uh, and then, um, uh, then we realize what being human is about. You know, when Blake was, was saying that um, all the spiritual world, the, you know, the, the gods and demons and everything else, when he's saying these are all internal, it could be tempting to say, well, that diminishes them, right? You, it's, you know, it's that shrinks them down to something much smaller. Blake didn't see it in those terms because he, what he thought he was doing was elevating our internal world uh, and bringing that up to the level of divine. Uh, and the divine was something that he could experience and he thought everyone could experience and he wanted everyone to experience. Um, and so, and, and, and so this, is, this, is, this is how he wanted us to be. Um, and that's kind of why he ended his life so happy, really, and so blissful. And the, the people around him um, after when he died, people who knew him, um, talk about him almost as, as, as a saint with an air about him in, in the small rooms that he, he rented. Um, there were like nowhere else on earth. There was a lightness. There was a, a, a real... Um, sense that you were entering a sort of enchanted space. He sort of gave off this, uh, this air. Um, but he never, you know, attempted to be seen as, you know, a, a guru or, or, or something like that. He never attempted to sort of uh, put himself up above other people uh, because he was so talented and, and, and so uh, special and so visionary. He was always stressing his humanity because for him, humanity was just the most glorious thing in, in the universe. And he just wanted everybody else to realize the sort of divine uh, sense uh, of what can occur in our consciousness and hence experience the full um, state of, of what it was to be a, a, a living human being. Um, and yeah, and it all, comes down to that small little twist 
in philosophy, in our worldview, that, 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 that exterior, interior sort of thing. It meant that he did not fit his days. He did not chime with his days. Uh, he was not... Um, he wasn't successful or understood or anything like that. But really, these were minor things because, uh, you know, I, I always remember the words of a, a friend of mine, an old beat poet who's very experienced, uh, very, very influenced by Blake. And he would always say, John, we've just got to start fucking around. We're a paradise's old birthright. That's where we're supposed to be. And reading Blake um, shows you that. Uh, and I heartily recommend everyone try to sort of get Blake into their lives in some way. You know, this, this book I've written, William Blake Versus the World, was intended as sort of a way in, it was sort of a way into that sort of great castle. But I, and I hope that if people read that, they would then feel comfortable to then go back to Blake's work uh, and, um, and read him themselves. Because I do believe it will enrich your life. I do believe you'll have a better quality of life um, if you have Blake. Uh, in it um, and I should probably stop rabbiting on after, after all that that's probably more than enough but uh, thank you uh, for listening uh, anyone uh, out there Jules is that all right thank you very much John that's fantastic yes absolutely brilliant thank you um, so we're going to take uh, some uh, questions from everybody now um, let, uh, let me invoke my 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 organizer privilege to start off um, in terms of, uh, John, of, of that idea of kind of combining, not separating soul and matter, yeah. but trying to combine them together, um, it reminds me, I'm, I'm, I've been researching Aldous Huxley, and, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in his late years, he got into Tantra and the idea of making the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. uh, and then that, that, that Tantric idea of it, developing your spirituality, but not at, at the cost of, like, the body and sexuality and so on. Yeah. Am I, am I right in thinking Blake um, was a kind of very early adopter of of some kind of Tantra? Or I mean, can you tell us a bit about the role of of of, of, of sex in his worldview and in his spirituality? Yeah, he was like um, I, I, I recently wrote an article for an online music paper called The Quietus, comparing Blake to Prince. And, and for many reasons, but the main one for both of them. Uh, you know, spirituality and sexuality were indistinguishable. Essentially, they were all part of the part of the, the same thing. Uh, Blake talked about um, how there was no distinction between the soul and the body, uh, and, and that's that's where he differed from, say, Gnostics or, or, or idealists in, in, in general. Uh, this belief in the body, and there's a lot of symbolism in Blake based on that, like the foot. The foot always comes into it, and the foot is the lowest part of the body that enters the vegetal world and there's all this all this sort of stuff um there's a, it's 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 uh it's a rich and, and common thread uh in in blake's work the importance of sexuality uh, uh one reason for it may well be that um he always believed that people's imagination was essentially a muscle that could that could grow and expand and, and you can strengthen your imagination uh and for most people uh, the sexual imagination is the easiest way to do that because it's very easy to fall into sexual imagination, whereas the sort of imagination to produce the artworks that Blake were doing are a lot harder. So that's, that was a great way to sort of uh, strengthen your imagination in a way that will be sort of spiritually um, rewarding. So there is a, is a real sort of connection to that. Um, he, um, if you look at works, especially Visions of the Daughters of Albion, um, they were really picked up on in the in the 1960s as this real sort of liberated uh, free love sort of manifesto is, is very much uh, how they were portrayed uh, and there seems there's, there's, there's evidence that um, there was a lot of grief with his wife in the 1790s because of his beliefs and how he wanted to take another partner and that's caused his wife a lot of hurt and there's no evidence that anything actually ever happened um, this, this sense of uh, the body being spirit and, and pleasure and ecstasy. There's no, for Blake, there's no difference between like spiritual ecstasy and physical ecstasy. It's just ecstasy. It's the experience of ecstasy and how that comes. Uh, is matter, what, what matters 
it's the ecstasy you know that's the experience of it so he was um certainly way way ahead of a lot of thinking uh in in, in terms of um sexuality there was a lot there was a lot of it around there's a, a very interesting book called why mrs blake cried which is the one that suggests that um that he was practicing a form of tantra in, in his 40s or something like that and um personally i feel it's a bit of a stretch um but it's a very fascinating book and well worth well worth the read and it certainly sort of fits uh with his ideas and with huxley as you say the 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 uh, the, the, the the christian tradition uh and the, the gnostic tradition um that the soul is uh, imprisoned by the flesh that the flesh is bad uh and um you know hence all that self-flagellation or the or, the, or those guys in Monty Python films banging themselves on the head when they're chanting and that sort of that damage to the, the, the flesh and the, mm -hmm. the denial of the flesh. No, that's, that wasn't Blake at all. And he thought, he saw that uh, as extremely damaging. You know, you were denying, you were denying people that the pleasure that the existence on earth should have. He, he talked of uh, priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires you know he, he was just he just hated all that sort of stuff mm. um yeah yeah so he was so mm. i can totally understand understand why huxley uh and, and i guess like, as beats like ginsburg and, and yeah. leary were, were big fans of, of him yeah. but um let's just, just say to our audience um you uh, put your hand up either either physically um, or or there's a button you can put your hand up if you if you have um, a, a question that you'd like to share. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep on asking questions. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, great. Here we go. Um, so, uh, Jonathan uh, Wolf, would you like to go first? Just unmute yourself, and then we've got Kenneth afterwards. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, John. It was uh, it's really really enjoyed it. Really fascinating. Thank you very much. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, it's really, really enjoyable. Um, I just have a basic question. Was, um, uh, was Blake ever into any kind of um, taking any psychedelics or anything to stimulate his imagination? Because obviously there's a kind of sense mm. that he has that kind of level of creativity, perhaps naturally himself. But I was just wondering if he was ever induced to, uh, to, to take anything to get to that sort of transcendent, almost sort of symbolic, yeah. logical level. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, a common belief. Well, certainly it was again back in the, the 1960s when there's this real resurgence of interest in Blake because of the psychedelic counterculture and because people who were uh, experimenting with LSD and with mushrooms were going back to Blake and going it's that that's exactly it what he's describing is exactly the sort of experience that, that, that we're having so uh, it was it was sort of quite commonly believed that it would have been mushrooms because he lived in the southeast of England, he would have been sort of taking mushrooms. Uh, I, I think that it's generally accepted now that that's not the case. Yeah. Um, for well, a number of reasons. Um, the main one being that he experienced visions from as a small child uh, right to the end of his life at the age of sixty-nine. Throughout the whole thing, there wasn't like a period where he discovered this this this, this mushroom thing. Um, uh, uh, but more it's just a historical there's so there's, a, there's a, a great book called shroom by a guy called andy lecter if you're interested in this which is about the history of magic mushrooms um uh, in this in this country uh and he basically argues that um before huxley and before leary uh there was no um cultural framework of seeing psychedelic experiences in a positive way in this country, certainly in the last few hundred years. Anyway, uh, there's a very few uh, reported uh, uh, instances of people taking uh, psychedelic mushrooms, and they're all horror stories. They're, they all believe they've been possessed by the devil, or that they're going to die, or they're just, just you know, that they lived in this world and the world distorted and became evil and horrible, and they utterly freaked out and they had a really bad trip. A trip uh, to hell, kind of thing. Uh, sorry like a trip to hell almost. exactly yeah. exactly because they hadn't had someone like you know leary sort of framing that way as a positive you know personal growth experience they didn't have that they had the church yeah. giving them that sort of worldview um so yeah so it's 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 generally accepted i think that it, it he didn't need 
from himself. It, yeah, it came from himself. But it was a very similar thing. Yeah. Logically, a very similar thing was occurring. Yeah. Uh, and I talk, I talk a lot about in the book about the, the, the loss of the sense of self. That's an important part of the, the vision experience. There's a, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of ways to sort of get that way, whether with various forms of meditation or, 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 or whatever. But um, yeah, he, he didn't need it as, as, I, as I understand it. But okay. we can learn a lot from comparing the, the two. Experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Reminding me, uh, actually, Huxley's Doors of Perception, that's from Blake, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's from Blake. Because yeah. he, you know, when he was writing about his masculine experience in the 19th, I can't remember exactly, but it was the 1930s. Uh, 50s, it was, yeah. he had, what, what else had he to go back to, to sort of put a framework or a way to look at it? It just had to be Blake. There was really sort of nothing else. So mm. uh, Doors of Perception is from Blake and Heaven and Hell is, is from Blake. And then you get Jim Morrison, in the doors based on the doors of perception uh and, and and so forth yeah he was he was a real influence in that sort of way mm. thank you uh kenneth do you want to unmute yourself uh, brilliant <laughs> if the doors of perception were cleansed everything would appear to man as it is infinite infinite yes <laughs> <laughs> um uh, uh yes the um I, I love your book i've only just started to read it but it's oh, thank you uh, uh just amazing um particularly helpful to me because I'm I'm going to in a moment I'm going to plug I'm I do a one man show about William Blake which is oh. going to be on at the German Street Theater in July and is also streaming live online I'll just put the information on the chat if that's yeah. okay yeah please, please do please do yeah and uh, I, I would particularly love you to see it and, and your, um, yeah. your feelings about it, because I have found this incredibly inspiring. And this this session we've just had now is definitely going to influence that show. Um, this is very pleasing to hear. Yeah. Are you, uh, play, are you playing Blake? Blake? I'm playing Blake. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can see you playing Blake very yeah. much so. I mean, Blake doesn't have a beard and I won't either for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I've, it's a show I've been developing since 2007. Actually, I've done it, you know, here and there, now and again, and a couple uh -huh. of years. Uh -huh. and this is a new version of it. But uh, I'm going to take away the advert right now and uh, get to my question, which is mm -hmm. first, the first sentence of your book mentions this gentleman, Henry Crabb Robinson. Yes. And I thought, oh, my God, what a resource uh, just to read this man's first hand account. Yeah of Blake the man as he was in everyday life. How do we access the writings of uh, Henry Crabb Robinson? Well, um, they are, well, I've got them in a few places. Uh, it, it depends how deep you want to go. Um, I, uh, one second. Got this in. Um, if, if, you, if you really want to look into it, uh, this book, Blake Records, uh, by Bentley is oh. the uh, it's astonishing it's just every known checked academic fact about Blake in his life everything that was said about him everything that was written all his letters you know it's like all the 20th century's uh, Blakean academic research available for about 40 quid from Amazon yeah uh, that would, <laughs> that's a must for me but uh, it, um, the the um, the, the stuff with Crab Robinson is available online. Uh, All right. You can't just find it by Googling. Okay. Uh, um, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the particular site is. It may be a wiki quote sort of, sort of thing. Uh, um, oh, there's, oh, sorry, that's your, that's your theatre show came up. I thought it was right. Yes, yes. Um, but so you don't have to spend any money and you, and you can find it. And um, yeah. uh, I, you know, if, if you message me, um, I will, be able to send you a link or something to it. Right? Yeah, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Yeah. That, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, yes. Do come and see the show, folks, or or we'll mm. see it online because uh, basically every word in the show is William Blake's. Mm. Uh, I've, I've taken bits and pieces and collated them together to form a kind of a loose narrative about Blake's frustrations with living in in the artistic world and how he was viewed and uh but then allowing him to go off into his his visions and his imagination um, oh okay good luck with it kenneth i hope you. it goes very well yeah, uh, no, vanessa vanessa we've got another question and then monica 
Thanks, John. I really enjoyed that. And I just wondered if you could say something about um, Blake and Dante. I remember at the end of that amazing Tate exhibition yeah. I, that there were his illustrations for the Divine Comedy, but I was too exhausted by that point to kind of take them in. And I just yeah. wondered, obviously, he was such a huge loner, but did he consider um, Dante a sort of soul friend? Were they? Yeah. Very much so. Yes, very much so. Uh, he loved he loved Dante. I believe he learned Italian so that he could read it in the original. Um, there was an English translation available uh, and he'd been commissioned to make all these, these artworks from it. And I love the fact that um, obviously Dante, uh, it's, it's, it's heaven and purgatory and paradise. It's the three separate uh, realms. Um, and in the book, I think they're exactly the same length to the stanza. I think there's a real sort of numerological thing going on with the number three and the number nine for the Trinity and all this sort of stuff going on. Uh, and Blake just did about 80% of his stuff was uh, hell. He just, did, he just did drawing after drawing after drawing the hell thing and then maybe about 13% in purgatory and about seven in, in, in paradise. He was really drawn to... Um, uh, the early early stuff and it's just so brilliantly um, coloured. There's a real sense that there's, there's there's like white light coming from the ground in all these sort of caverns and, and uh, uh, it's 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 great work. He didn't finish, unfortunately. It was in his later years, um, and he was still working on 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 his uh, his series when he died. But the notion of Dante and Virgil. Uh, a living, po well, when Dante wrote, uh, uh, wrote his work, uh, a living poet being visited by um, one of the great pagan poets of, of Rome and being given a tour of, of heaven and hell. Uh, it was clear in, uh, inspiration for his own Milton, in which case Milton came to visit him in the form of a star and sort of landed on his foot for various sim symbolic reasons. Uh, so it was, it was a work that certainly uh, uh, hugely inspired him um, throughout his life, uh, which he went back to again and again and again. Uh, and obviously there's a sort of moralistic Catholic side uh, to Dante that's not Blake, but he didn't care because it was, as he thought it was pure vision, the whole the Paradise Lost was, was just clear, uh, clear vision. And he worked on that, and he worked on the Pilgrim's Progress uh, in his late, and they're both stories of uh, the, the journey of the soul um, through the underworld, through the dark world, and finally reaching the celestial city. So they're all ultimately positive. They're all a story of soul finding um, in, enlightenment, for one of a better word, finding that light uh, uh, inside them. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's specific enough for... No, that's great. For, that's for lovely. Interest. Thank you. Yeah. Really I, I, write, I write a bit more about it in, in, towards the end of the book, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly... And the fact that um, the cover is, is one of those illustrations with this, this giant oh, okay. them down to the lower areas of, a, of hell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Monica, you are muted at the moment. How about now? Mm. Now, great. There you okay, are. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I just had a, I just had a, a question regarding Blake's um, relationship to hermet hermetic philosophy as well as uh, the mm. Gnostics, because there are, um, a, as I think, differences in the fact that the Gnostics would consider man's um, kind of fall to earth as a as a sort of cosmic catastrophe yeah and whereas the hermetics would um i think it was it seen more as a leap or an embrace and yeah. where did sort of blake stand on that yeah um as you can pro as you can probably guess it was it was more towards the hermetic style he, he was certainly influenced by people like paracelsus um there's a lot of comparisons made to Blake and Gnostic thought because of that character Eurizen I was talking about, who in many ways is very similar to the Gnostic Demiurge, this sort of, this, this, this mad God who thinks he's the creator God, but he isn't really. Mm. Uh, and he's the, he's the thing that blocks the light behind him, the, the, the Gnostic Demiurge. So, so there is a lot of um, uh, comparison to both. Blake, doesn't fit neatly into any one category. Um, he is ultimately too Christian to 
fully embrace the uh, hermetic uh, perspective. Um, but he's always there's a, there's a lot of Taoism in him. There's, you could you could argue that he was an atheist if he really wanted to, although he would have hated you for it. But you can construct mm -hmm. that argument. The, um, there's 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 a lot of Indian thought into him, uh, but but certainly when you get to ideas like the universal man uh, and the um, the universe being within and without and as above and so below and uh, all this sort of stuff, there's a very it was very clear he was hugely influenced by all this stuff. But we don't quite know the route it came to him. I think actually we do. I've got, if, if, in other times, I'd go research this. I've got a book there that would tell, <laughs> that would tell me everything. And but it's it's interesting that someone like Swedenborg always sort of denied that he was influenced by that that load of thought. Uh, Blake didn't. Blake, you know, was was happy to embrace it. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. definitely all there in the mix. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Ali. Ali Johnson. Hey, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Ali. Um, so with Blake being so critical of people who couldn't see beyond their um, rational worldview, did he actually provide any kind of techniques beyond just using your imagination more? And did well, he actually help anyone within his lifetime to kind of, did he kind of convert anyone to his worldview? Um, his method of doing so was to work was to create, was to create art. Uh, and that worked for him because the, the creative part of the mind, which he called a thona, um, was a block to yours. As, there's a lot of his work, he, he talks about this. But for me, I think what it was is because, you know, there's a whole history of people having visionary experiences. Um, and I talk about uh, in the book a little bit about William James's book, The Varieties of Religious, Religious Experience at the beginning of the 20th century, which is the first time that people looked at these outside of their cultural contexts and said that, hey, these things uh, happen cross-culturally, universally over time. There's something that happened to people. Uh, and obviously people interpret them in their own sort of cultural sort of way, but let's look at them for what they are and what's similar about them. And uh, the things he picks up on are, are first the sort of ineffable nature of them, the inability of people to properly express what they've experienced or people who haven't experienced them in the way that, you know, if, you know, if I had eaten mustard and you'd not had mustard, there's no way I could tell you what mustard was like, it would just be utterly beyond me. Uh, and the noetic uh, quality of them of just being drenched in information, there's this huge blast of information. So throughout history, people have been having these visionary experiences and not being able to communicate them to people. But because Blake was such a brilliant painter and such a brilliant writer and such a brilliant you know, creative mind, he comes closest to being able to say, I've had these experiences and my proof is this. And you look at the work and you go, oh, actually, I believe him. I, I generally believe him, isn't it? There's, there's, uh, these are from a place outside of what I am. Uh, and so his work serves, because all it, all it basically comes down to is people to sort of understand and accept that there's something outside them that there's that, that they have this limited perspective but there's something outside them and they and it's available to everyone and they they, they can sort of get it uh, and his work I, I think for a lot of people there's been proof that it exists and if you once you believe that it exists then you can start to move towards it I think um, there's I mean his there's a book he wrote called The Four Valors. Uh, sorry, The Four Zoas. Originally it was called Valor, but it, it was called The Four Zoas, which are the four separate parts of the mind. Uh, and it wasn't generally that available before the, the, the late 20th century. So when there was this huge interest in him with Ginsburg and people like that in the 1960s, his work tended to be presented as the, the rational side, Eurism of the mind was bad, but loss or thrown at the creative side was good and it would defeat uh, the, the, this rigid sort of hierarchical, patriarchal sort of thing and be thrown in our mind and that's how we would defeat it. When people got to read The Four Valors, 
they realized it was wasn't that at all it was it was just once eurism realized his limits then the mind naturally almost falls back into balance and then all the characters have this huge feast and it ends by saying and sweet science reigned and stuff like that so there's it's it's a, it's a strong argument about the need to have, you just need a little bit of transcendence in your life we all do we all need a bit of transcendence uh just to get outside of that chattering monkey part of your left hand side brain uh and once you've just done that once or twice you just know it's real and you sort of know it's possible uh and, and you know meditation and things like that are, are, are great for that um it's 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 if you've never seen it it's very easy to go well i'm sure that's bollocks right that's that's not real you know you could be a i'm a strict materialist and none of that makes any sense and i'm not having it but once you've once you've just looked outside it you can't say that anymore um and so blake sort of helps that i, I would say anyway if if that answers your question ali i don't know if that's a bit rambly sorry about that that does yeah thank you i i guess i was just thinking well um comparing kind of say you know the in the Buddhist world, there's kind of maybe structured kind of systematic ways of reaching, you know, views of kind of emptiness and kind of mystical states, whereas yeah. Blake very much seems to be like, these are the experiences that I've had. And he also seems kind of a little bit critical of people who kind of can't see that way, but he almost like he doesn't really provide any structure or information. Yeah, but maybe it, that's just... It's yeah. because those systematic ways that you're talking of are exactly that they're systematic ways so they're essentially that their eurism itself they're that they're that sort of that that part of the brain he's trying to get you out of uh sure. so he's not using in a way he is because he's writing and, and language and reading and things are all part of the same sort of brain but he's trying to you know uh just present you with i don't just hear something beautiful to sort of snap you out of that he's, he's trying he's trying other ways really right thank you thank you uh, I suppose I kind of I, Ali's kind of what, suggesting in a way there's a kind of privatization. I mean, the difference between him and Dante is he's inventing his own landscape, isn't he? His own mythology, and it's the beginning of that. You know, in the next two hundred years, you have lots of people inventing their own mythology. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, yeah. it becomes quite normal, and he's the first or well, early stage in that kind of. Definitely, he, he was um, he was certainly criticised for it by I think was it T.S. Eliot in in. Um... The early 20th century and sort of the modernist sort of period uh, as, as I have to go and read these things but uh, as I understand it Eliot's argument was like I love the, the poetry and I love the artwork stuff like that but this this mythology thing for god's sake why didn't you just use existing mythologies after what Blake had that thing was I must create a system or be enslaved by another man so, you know that was that was um, that was his way of, of throwing off the mind forged manacles which is just such a mm. wonderful wonderful term uh, and now in the, you know, beyond the postmodern period, um, we're very, very comfortable with people creating their own mythologies and, uh, and, and moving between them. And, um, and in many ways, we have a great hunger for mythologies with things like the Game of Thrones, the entire history of uh, Westeros is, is quite common knowledge, amazingly, you know, in, in the West and, th and things like that. So we're much more, much more comfortable with it now. But we're not, we're not taught it at school. And it's not, this is Blake's, I mean, uh, and it's, it's, it's a shame uh, because once you're into Blake, you just wish that everybody had the same set of references because something will happen and you'll, you'll just want to go, that's Eurism talking. And, you, and if, if that was a common cultural reference and everybody got it, it'd be a great toolkit for, you know, discussing things. So I'd love, I'd love it if people just, you know, understood and recognised and, and normalised Blake's mythology. I think that would be amazing. Mm. Dan, uh, last question just from the audience. Thank you. Hi, John. Thanks for that. Hi, um, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking what you're saying about Eliot and, and mythology and about how, you know, we, we have a hunger for mythology. And I think I, I used to feel like Eliot did. There were certain people that I respected their art and what they're doing, but then they seem to have this Kind of, and actually it was you as well in another book, in your KLF book, talking about Alan Moore. And, when, and I love Alan Moore's writing, I love his books. 
but there was this whole mythology, I'm a wizard stuff sort of going yeah. on that, that kind of turned me off, but turned me off to the point that I didn't actually go and read more about it. So yeah. when I read what you were saying and what, what he's actually saying is like, you know, I don't really believe in magic. I know I'm not a wizard, mm. but I can live in such a way that I embrace just a, a particular kind of way of looking at the world. It helps me in my creativity mm -hmm. and I just enjoy it more. And it, it, it's always the, the way somebody should. And, and how can you not sort of agree with that? Mm. And, and I think what you're saying about that we hunger for these mythologies, but a lot of, you know, I think most of the examples you've given are sort of, you know, it's stories, it's fiction, yeah. things that today I think we use, we allow ourselves that when we're being entertained. Yeah. And, and I think we, we often see our like real life as separate to our life when we're watching a film or in front of the TV or something like mm -hmm. that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's okay mm -hmm. to sort of indulge in that and be scared of the weeping angels and, mm -hmm. you know, with you and your kid next to you and, and that kind of stuff. But, but then actually when you go to work, Mm -hmm. or we go out into the world we, we, we have to be very serious and, and and this is it because this is all that really exists and I think you know re religious people for the main part I think live their lives day to day mm -hmm. uh, at, at least in the west as though this this is it there isn't really this other this other kind of this other kind of world and I think and and then what you're saying about sort of steps to and, and Blake maybe being frustrated with other people for not being able to see the world the way he did mm -hmm but just because he didn't have to actually try. If he had it since he was a kid, that was yeah. just a, a way of living. Yes. I, don't, I, I don't know if there's a question, but I suppose I'm thinking it's that, you know, if, if you're not a particular kind of, born in a particular kind of way, if you don't have a particular kind of physical makeup, obviously some people experience that through illness and stuff, and you don't want to take psychedelic drugs, mm -hmm. is the best that the vast majority of us can hope for is to, try and live it vicariously through other people and, and learn from their art. But we might end up frustrating ourselves if we try and do it as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things to all that. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Swedish mystic Swedenborg in, in the book, uh, who was a big influence on Blake, so he, he figures quite highly. But he's a great example of a person who was just very, very rational. He was this establishment figure. He, well, his father was ennobled. He was uh, in charge of all the mines in Sweden. He knew the king. He was probably a spy. He was a scientist. He wrote books on mineralogy. And then in his 50s, it changed and it came for him. And there's many examples of people who just are sensible and rational. And, and, then, and then one day it gets them. Uh, Jung has a great word for this. I can't quite remember what that is. So it can come for anyone at any time. But to go back to what you talked about earlier, um, if you can ever find a book uh, by a guy called Rogan Taylor called The Death and Resurrection Show. Um, it's not easy to get hold of, and it often goes for a, a lot of money, but it's, uh, it speaks exactly to what you were talking about. His argument is that uh, basically showbiz entertainment uh, has grown out of um, early religion, a sort of sh a shamanic sort of religion. Uh, and to some extent, it sort of had to hide what it really was uh, to appeal to, but on another extent, it's sort of lost what it really was as well in, in, in different ways and become this sort of entertainment that doesn't, that it was no longer transformative. It was just something to sort of fill your life with. Um, and I think you would, I, I think you would love that book massively. Uh, and it would speak to a lot of um, the concerns that you were, you were going for. The Death and Resurrection Show by Rogan Taylor. If a library has it or something like that, you should go get that, definitely. I love the thought of a book changing hands for vast amounts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such a nice thought. Um, it's one of those books, I mean, it's, Julian Cope did a song called The Death and Resurrection Show and right. Killing Joke have used it. It's one of those books that made a real huge impact on people, um, but was like published in the 90s and in one edition, it didn't really sort of sell and it's been out of print for a long time. So getting hold of it is a, That's is a, cool. a nightmare, but. Like, like didn't Blake's Jerusalem sell like one copy or maybe yeah, no copies? Like three copies or, or, or something like that. Yeah, his, his audience um, was him and the spirits, basically. That was the audience and, and people to come. I ask you just finally, John, um, about your own work and, and how, you see this book fitting into that and do I mean 
you talked a bit about the idea of um, multiple angles to issues. And I've seen that in, in the book of yours, I read about the history of the 20th century and then you were talking yeah. about kind of modernism and relativity and that explosion of multiple perspectives. Yeah. Um, what, what else would you say is a kind of principal theme? I mean, I, I mentioned how, you know, your, the, the, the KLF and their role in British culture and, the, you know, and Blake, is there an interest as well in like the kind of the occult and mystical side of what is such a kind of often just non-mystical mainstream culture as in Britain? Are you trying to do kind of counter mystical histories of Britain or, 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 or just how, how do you see this kind of Blake fitting into your, what, what interests you, the, the big broad questions that you've explored through, through these books? Um, that's a very hard <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I kind of think I'd just write all my books and then if anyone wanted to work out what it was about, then that's fine by that by me. But um, certainly I, I'm aware that in a lot of my books, Blake has popped up as a, as a, a recurring motif and recurring reference long before I thought I'd write about him, uh, simply because I find him so useful and because his worldview is so um, uh, useful, really, uh, uh, for me. Um, I do go to the counterculture quite a lot for um, ideas that help, I think, make sense of this world. Um, although I don't think I just write about the counterculture. You know, I wrote a book like Watling Street or a book about the 20th century, which mixes the counterculture and the avant-garde with the, uh, the, the, the mainstream. I, you know, I, I like both. I like both. I like that, you know, I do, what I like about something like the KLF is that, yes, it was the strangest, most occult story in music, but it was happening right in front of people's eyes. They were sort of number one on top of the pops and, you know, in the Sun newspaper. And it was this extraordinary sort of uh, theatrical, um, rit ritualistic sort of occult thing happening in front of the mainstream audience because it was so strange. They just couldn't, couldn't see it. It was, it was like the emperor's new clothes. You know, if, you, if you're that weird in front of everyone, people just won't say yeah. anything. You're a little bit weird, they'll, they'll pick it up on on something. Um, I don't know, cognitive history, the way um, our understanding uh, of the world evolves and changes uh, is uh, a big theme for my sort of stuff. You know, the idea that, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of history, you know, the guns, germs, steel sort of, sort of history, which is great, you know, the physical world, the physical things that cause about history and changes and, and, uh, and whatnot is, is great, but there's also the notion that you know ideas you know ideas create values and values create actions and actions create history and that what can start off uh, as an idea um, can then go on to have you know world changing uh, impact um, and having lived through the latter half of, of the 20th century when the idea um, where people were raised with the notion that the individual is primary and that we should understand things as an individual uh, and, and that, is, that is the greatest good. Um, I, I've watched that sort of gradually collapse and erode and fall away and in, into this much more 21st century understanding that no, it's really the network, the, 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 our relationships, our sense of ourselves makes no sense at all uh, if you do not include who we're connected to and, and, and what our what we influence and you know the idea of what we can achieve and what we can do uh, as an, an individual just doesn't explain it it's just it's just not enough and so there's this huge um, huge shift in uh, I mean I, I, I see it as people raised online versus people who are raised um, in front of telly uh, you know, the post-war generation this was when individualism really sort of uh, um, kicked off and became mainstream and caused all these all these uh, you know changes in the 1960s and uh, and all all that sort of stuff but there was a sense that um, there was there was kind of like a lovecraftian aspect to it where the individual was like you know small and threatened and the 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 universe was uh, incomprehensible and, and overly powerful and, and, could, and, and didn't care and could destroy you at any, any sort of time. And you were really separate from it. You were small and separate from it and you were the focus of the story. Um, for people raised online, the notion that you're separate from things has 
faded quite a bit and it's brought in a lot of responsibility really and a lot of awareness about the impact of what our actions do uh, uh, and, and um and hence there's this huge um, uh, generational war going on between people younger than me and people older than me. I'm Generation X, so I'm sort of in the middle going, stop fighting everyone, but that, you know, <laughs> the, the OK Boomer thing and the snowflake thing, all, all that sort of, I think is this fundamental shift from understanding yourself as an individual to realizing that the model of the individual is is outdated and, and, and no longer adequate to, to see our world. That's a, that's definitely a, a theme that recurs quite a lot. Mm, well, that and thank slipping you. in mentions of Doctor Who, <laughs> I always like to do. <laughs> well, brilliant. Thank you very much, Don. Real pleasure uh, to to meet you and to hear about this new book. And I uh, can't wait to 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 dig in. Um, so uh, yes, everyone, go and go and buy a copy of the book. And uh, thanks so much to John. We can unmute ourselves and just say uh, thank you to him. Before we all log off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jules. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jules. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Okay. Kenneth, oh, yeah, John, if you yep. can message me when you're doing that show, if you could find me on Twitter or something. Okay, I've just found you on Facebook, so I'll Perfect. message you on that. Great. Lovely. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jules.